It is my sincere pleasure to introduce this year's Mod Abbott Lecturer, Dr. Stuart Schnitt. Dr. Schnitt is well known to members of this audience for his many contributions to USCAP over a very long period of time, as well as his major contributions to our understanding of non-neoplastic and neoplastic breast diseases. Dr. Schnitt is currently the Vice Chair for Anatomic Pathology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, co-leader of the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center Breast Program, and Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Schnitt did his internship and residency in anatomic and clinical pathology at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, followed by a fellowship in surgical pathology at that same institution. He has an incredible career of academic achievement, co-authoring over 320 original articles, review papers, editorials, commentaries, numerous book chapters, primarily in the area of breast pathology. He has authored a popular breast pathology textbook entitled Biopsy Interpretation of the Breast, now in its second edition, and is one of the editors of the fourth edition of the WHO Classification of Tumors of the Breast, published in 2012. As mentioned earlier, Dr. Schnitt has contributed in many ways to the USCAP, serving as short course director on numerous occasions, moderator many times, contributor to diagnostic pathology, and a member of innumerable committees, including the Education Committee, culminating in serving as president of the USCAP in 2010-2011. He is considered to be one of the finest educators in pathology and is particularly proud of having been involved in the training of 31 breast pathology program, uh, fellows since 1995. Even more importantly, for those of you who personally know Dr. Schnitt, you know what I already know, that he is one of the smartest, <clears throat> smartest and kindest and funniest individuals in our profession. It is really a great pr privilege of mine and an honor to introduce Dr. Stuart Schnitt. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Have fun. Thank you, John. John just said to me, this better be a hell of a lecture. <laughs> it's a pretty high standard. Well, first thing I'd like to do is to thank the Academy for this unbelievable honor. And like Tom Colby, uh, I went and looked at the prior Maud Abbott lecturers and could not believe that I would be on this list, so I really thank you for this honor. So what I'd like to talk about is the essential role of the pathologist in guiding the management of patients with breast cancer from morphology to molecules, and I have no disclosures. So when I was asked to give this lecture, it really put me in a precarious position, and I thought to myself, what am I gonna discuss? So, I went through an algorithm and I said, okay, the first thing I need to discuss is something I know about, which eliminated about 99% of possibilities. Then I said, well, I'd like to talk about something on which I've worked for a long time, and then something that can illustrate the essential role of the pathologist in helping to guide patient management, which is what our profession is all about. So what I ultimately came to was this, the role of the pathologist in the selection of breast cancer patients for treatment with breast conserving therapy, a personal and historic perspective. So for me, it all began on match day in March 1979, when I received this slip in my medical school mailbox, which told me that I matched at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, which in fact was my first choice. And I was really thrilled about this. All throughout medical school, I read the New England Journal and knew that there was a section periodically appearing in the New Eng England Journal called Seminars in Medicine of the Beth Israel Hospital. And I said, wow, I get to do my residency at that prestigious institution. But also at that time, there was a novel that had come out called The House of God. And this was written by a disgruntled Beth Israel house officer named Samuel Shem which was this racy novel which sold a million copies. So I said, I really need to go to this institution. So here I am as a first year resident in July of 1979. And to show you how prescient I was, the reason I had this picture taken is I said to one of my fellow residents, please take a picture of me as a first year resident in case in about 30 or 40 years, I get to give the Maud Abbott lecture. Now, there are a couple of things to note about this picture. If you look at the shelf to my upper left, there are specimens there. And this was the desk of a colleague of mine, Dr. Andy Rickey. And for some reason, he felt that it was important to keep specimens close to his desk. That's not something we would do today. 
The other thing to note is that I am wearing white pants. Now, as incoming house officers, for whatever reason, pathology residents were given white pants. Didn't seem like a real good idea at the time. But anyway, I wore them every day. I figured as a sort of impoverished, indebted uh, house officer, why should I wear my own pants? I'll wear the white pants. But little did I know that it would cost me half my salary in bleach to keep them clean during my first year. So I went along as a first year resident, did my work, and then in my second year as a resident, Jim Connolly, one of our attending pathologists who is still there, uh, came to me and said, do you want to get involved in a research project? So I said, sure. And this was the background that he gave me about the project. He said that Beth Israel Hospital was a member institution of the Harvard Joint Center for Radiation Therapy, or JCRT. And since 1968, the JCRT had arguably, arguably been the leading center in the US for the treatment of women with breast cancer using the combination of breast conserving surgery and radiation therapy as an alternative to mastectomy. And you may not realize this now, but back then that was a very controversial way to treat patients with breast cancer. This is from an article in JAMA in October 1982, and you can see the title, Treating Breast Cancer Conservatively, Dissension and Contention Continue. This was a very controversial thing to do. So anyway, with regard to more background, a small proportion of women treated with the conservative surgery and radiation therapy approach were known to develop a recurrence in the treated breast, and that was called the local recurrence or ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. But at that time, the factors associated with local recurrence were unknown. So what was the project? The project was to review breast cancer slides of women treated with breast conserving surgery and radiation therapy between 1968 and 1978 at the JCRT institutions. And the goal of this project was to determine if any pathologic features are associated with local recurrence. So what did we have to do? Well, this required pulling slides from the files at Beth Israel Hospital and collecting and organizing slides from other JCRT institutions. And I cannot tell you how many glass splinters I got pulling the slides from the files over many months. I had to photocopy pathology reports, help design worksheets for scoring the pathology features, and then finally, when all of this was together, review the slides and fill out the worksheets blinded to outcome. And this was done primarily at night and on weekends. Now, the real brains behind this project was Dr. Samuel Hellman, who is one of the most brilliant human beings I have ever met in my life. Dr. Hellman was the head of the Harvard Joint Center for Radiation Therapy from 1968 to 1983, subsequently, subsequently went on to become physician in chief at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and then dean of biological sciences at University of Chicago. And the Joint Center at that time consisted of the radiation therapy departments of Beth Israel Hospital, Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, Boston Hospital for Women, New England Deaconess Hospital, the Sidney Farber Cancer Institute, and Children's Hospital. And of note, of those institutions, Children's Hospital is the only one that still has the same name. So the operational radiation oncologist that I worked with most closely on this project was Dr. Jay Harris. At that time, Dr. Harris was a radiation oncologist at New England Deaconess Hospital, went on to become head of radiation oncology at Beth Israel, and until recently was chief of radiation oncology at the Brigham and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Now, Jay was very attuned to pathology and the importance of pathology, and he was very eager about this project. And I think one of the reasons Jay was so attuned to pathology is that he's married to Nancy Harris, who many of you may know as one of the world's most distinguished hematopathologists. And Jay always said that Nancy is the famous Dr. Harris. But both Jay Harris and Nancy Harris say there's even a more famous Harris in their family, their son, who's Dan Harris from ABC News. So let me take you back to the early days of breast conserving surgery and radiation therapy. And for those of you who are my vintage, you will probably remember this. For those of you who are younger, hopefully this will be sort of an enlightening educational experience. And I'm talking about 
1968 to the early to mid 1980s. So in those days, most breast cancers presented as palpable tumors. This was the pre-mammographic era. And the way breast conserving surgery and radiation worked was that the surgeon went in and removed the palpable tumor with a small rim of grossly normal surrounding breast tissue, and this was called a lumpectomy. This was followed by whole breast irradiation, typically with a boost or extra dose of radiation to the primary site to eradicate any residual subclinical disease in the breast while preserving cosmesis. Of note, at that time, mammography was not used preoperatively to assess the lesion extent or postoperatively to assess the adequacy of excision. You'll be shocked to hear this if you weren't around at the time, but pathology examination did not include evaluation of margins of excision of lumpectomy specimens. And I remember in those days, Sam Hellman said, we know patients have residual disease in the breast, that's why we radiate them. And in addition, in many cases, much of the tumor was being submitted for biochemical ER and PR assays. And in some instances, we only had a slide or two of the tumor to look at pathologically. So this was an example of a study worksheet that we designed. That's the data filled out in my handwriting. And you can see the long list of histologic features we thought it was, evaluable, uh, was important to evaluate, including histologic type, tumor border, et cetera. And after we had done the study and written up the data, I submitted an abstract to the US and Canadian division of the IAP, the forerunner of USCAP. And with the help of Carolyn Lane in the uh, Evans office, I was able to dig up the meeting book from the meeting at which I first presented these data. So on March 1st, 1983, at 3 o'clock PM, I gave my first platform presentation ever at this meeting on pathologic features predictive of local recurrence in early breast cancer treated by primary radiation therapy. And believe me, I was scared. The results of this study were ultimately published a year later in Cancer in 1984, uh, pathologic predictors of early local recurrence in stage one and two breast cancer treated by primary radiation therapy. And this is the most critical Kaplan-Meier curve from this paper. There were 154 patients that we studied and we were able to identify a high risk group that had a very poor local contr tumor control at five years, 61% or a 40% risk of local recurrence as compared to everyone else who had 96% local tumor control at five years. And what we found was that this high risk group consisted of patients whose tumors had what we called at that time an extensive introductal component or EIC. Now, this is an example of EIC from one of our early papers. You can see the image on the left consists of areas of invasive carcinoma with lots of associated DCIS. The image on the right shows the ad adjacent breast tissue, which also shows a lot of DCIS. So basically, these are invasive cancers who have lots of associated DCIS. So this, in fact, was the first study to identify a subgroup of patients at increased risk for local recurrence after breast conserving surgery and radiation therapy based on pathologic features. And when I presented this at USCAP as a fourth year resident in 1983, I thought it was really pretty amazing that we were able to find these kinds of results with this relatively small study. And I really felt like we had hit a home run here. And for the few of you in the audience who are not diehard Red Sox fans, this is David Ortiz hitting a home run. So anyway, I was brought back down to earth when you know, I was told, well, this is not the end, this is only the beginning. We made this observation, but we really have an obligation to further find out why this is the case. Why do patients who have an extensive introductal component have an increased risk of local recurrence? And just because we found it doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree. Can these findings be reproduced and generalized to other populations? So, we generated a hypothesis as to why this may be the case. 
And the hypothesis what, was that patients whose tumors have an extensive introductal component have a large burden of DCIS remaining in the breast after lumpectomy, and that this DCIS burden is not adequately treated with therapeutic doses of radiation. So we did a follow-up study looking at re-excision specimens in patients who had lumpectomies to see if this was possibly the case. And lo and behold, what we found was that patients whose tumors had an extensive introductal component tended to have a lot more residual DCIS in the breast than patients whose tumors didn't have an EIC. And that's illustrated here, and you can see that above this line, patients who had an EIC were the only ones who had the highest amounts of residual DCIS. So we said, wow, this is really pretty cool. We then followed this up with a collaborative study with Professor Roland Holland from Nijmegen in the Netherlands, who had an extensive collection of mastectomy specimens from patients with breast cancer that he studied by whole organ sectioning and careful radiologic correlation. And again, what we found in his database was that patients who had an EIC-positive tumor had a more, uh, uh, a more extensive volume of DCIS that extended a further distance from the primary site than patients whose tumors lacked an extensive introductal component. So all of this seemed to correlate and corroborate our hypothesis. And in fact, proving whether or not EIC was important became somewhat of a cottage industry in the 80s and 90s. This is an illustration of a 3D reconstruction of a breast cancer and the associated introductal component done by Otake et al. and published in Cancer in 1995. And this pinkish blob represents the invasive cancer. The yellow lines represent the associated DCIS. The uh, pink lines represent the associated DCIS, and the yellow lines represent normal ducts. And you can see why this might be associated with an increased risk of local recurrence, because if the surgeon goes in and does a lumpectomy with a small rim of uh, surrounding breast tissue, can't feel the surrounding DCIS and removes this, all of this DCIS remains in the breast near the primary site and serves as a potential source for local recurrence. So, over the years, a variety of studies were done that actually corroborated this finding. And this is a table from a review article that I wrote back in 1993, illustrating the effect of extensive introductal component on local recurrence from around the world. And basically, every study that looked at this found that this was a statistically significant factor associated with local recurrence. And that was despite the fact that many of these institutions used somewhat different definitions of EIC which said to us that this was a really robust prognostic factor because it almost doesn't matter how you define it. If the pathologist thinks there's a lot of associated DCIS, it's a risk factor for local recurrence. Now, you have to remember that these results from, were from a time when mammography was not routinely performed, relatively limited surgical excisions were done, this was just removal of the tumor with a narrow rim of surrounding tissue, and microscopic margins were not routinely assessed. So as the years went by, six randomized clinical trials comparing mastectomy to breast conserving surgery and radiation therapy demonstrated equivalent survivals. And in this meta-analysis published in 2006, you can see that with 20 years of follow-up, Patients who received breast conserving surgery and radiation therapy had the exact same breast cancer mortality rate as patients treated with mastectomy. So this was really a proven procedure. And two of the pioneers in this area who really deserve special mention were Dr. Bernard Fisher, who headed the NSABP B06 study, one of these randomized trials, and Professor Umberto Veronese, who headed the Milan trial, who have probably saved more women from having mastectomy than any people on earth and deserve enormous credit in moving this field forward. Furthermore, in 1991, the NIH issued a consensus statement on the treatment of early stage breast cancer and acknowledged that local excision and radiation therapy were equivalent to mastectomy and in fact was the preferable treatment because it preserved the breast. So as a result of this, as the years went by, the number of women opting for the breast conserving approach over mastectomy increased dramatically. But interestingly, this was largely a bicoastal phenomenon. This procedure was much more commonly done on the east and west coast than in the Midwest and South. 
and optimizing patient selection and identifying risk factors for local recurrence in women undergoing this approach became even more important. And as the years went by, mammographic evaluation became routine. Patients had preoperative mammography to assess the lesion extent, and we and others were able to do studies uh, developing uh, a, a knowledge base about mammographic correlates of cancers with an extensive introductal component. Furthermore, patients started having post-lumpectomy uh, mammography to assess the adequacy of excision and to identify patients likely to have considerable residual disease. And furthermore, as the pathologists know, more detailed pathologic evaluation of lumpectomy specimens became routine, including the routine evaluation of specimen margins. And this all resulted in better patient selection. And with better patient selection, EIC actually became less important as a prognostic factor for local recurrence, although it remained and still remains an important patient selection factor for this procedure. And even as recently as the most recent CAP guidelines for invasive breast cancer published in 2013, EIC is considered a factor to, to include in synoptic reports for patient with invasive breast cancer. And here's a page from the CAP guideline. It has these illustrations of EIC and the uh, excerpt from the uh, synoptic lines. Now, again, as the years went by with better patient selection, the status of the microscopic margins of excision emerged as the most important prognostic factor for local recurrence. And you're all familiar with how we evaluate specimen margins of breast lumpectomy specimens, inking them in one color if they're unoriented and six colors if they're oriented. Now, again, this was a relatively new thing in the late 80s and early 90s. And in 1994, we published this paper looking at the risk of local recurrence related to the microscopic margins of lumpectomy specimens. And in the introduction of the paper, we said the relationship between microscopic involvement of the margins and the likelihood of local recurrence has not been fully established. So this really shows you how early this was in this whole process. So in this paper, it was one of the first papers to illustrate that among patients with positive margins, the risk of local recurrence at five years was 11%, but among patients with negative margins, we had no local recurrences. Now, this seems really obvious now, but 20 plus years ago, it wasn't so obvious. And of course, as the years went by, many groups demonstrated that the risk of local recurrence was higher among patients with positive margins than among those with negative margins. And if we fast forward to 2010, there was a meta-analysis done of over 14,000 patients from 21 studies, which unequivocally showed that the odds ratio for local recurrence with positive margins was 2.42, not terribly surprising. But the definition of a negative or adequate margin in lumpectomy specimens varied from no tumor on ink to one to two to three millimeters to 10 millimeters. There was really no agreement. But at many institutions, there was and still is a proscribed minimum margin distance required for breast conserving treatment based on a variety of factors, including data from retrospective studies, but I think most commonly local lore and urban legend and how and where the surgeons were trained. This is really not evidence-based. So the real question is how negative does the margin really have to be in a lumpectomy specimen? And why does this even matter? Well, we know from numerous studies that the extent of the surgical resection is the most important determinant of the cosmetic outcome. And remember, breast conserving surgery and radiation therapy is not better than mastectomy, it's, to, it's equivalent in terms of survival. So what this really is, is a cosmetic procedure. And the whole reason for doing this is preserving the breast. So the idea in doing the lumpectomy is balancing local control with cosmesis. So what is an adequate lumpectomy margin? Well, Believe it or not, today, more than 25 years after the randomized clinical trials showed equivalence of lumpectomy and radiation to mastectomy, there is still no general agreement among surgeons or radiation oncologists as to what constitutes an adequate negative margin. There is no margin width about which more than 50% of surgeons or radiation oncologists agree is adequate or negative. All of the available data are from retrospective studies, and this issue has never been addressed in randomized clinical trials and never will be. Now, to show you an example of this, this is from a survey of surgeons that was published in 2010 
a little over 300 surgeons, and they were presented with various clinical scenarios and asked what they think an adequate margin would be. So in this scenario, a 60-year-old woman with a 0.8 centimeter invasive triple negative breast cancer who was planned to have radiation therapy, 11% said no tumor on ink is enough for me, that's good enough. But 42% they need, said they needed margins of at least one to two millimeters. 28% said, no, I need margins of more than five millimeters. And almost 20% said they want margins of more than a centimeter in this scenario. So the next time your surgical colleagues say to you, breast pathologists never agree about anything, you show them data like this. Now, radiation oncologists are no better. In this study published in 2005, over 700 North American radiation oncologists were asked, how do you define negative margins after local excision? About 46% said no ink on tumor is good enough for me, but the remainder were all over the place. Now, why is this important? Well, the variability in the definition of adequate negative margins results in a huge variability in the re-excision rates following breast conserving therapy. And in this paper, studied, uh, paper uh, published by McCahill and JAMA a few years ago, in a survey of 54 surgeons, they found that the range in re-excisions among these surgeons was from zero to 70%. That's really remarkable. Furthermore, almost half of the re-excisions were performed on patients who already had negative margins in the belief that a wider negative margin would improve local control. Now, why do we want to minimize re-excisions? Well, this is not a free lunch. There's a downside to re-excisions. It's associated with patient anxiety, poor cosmesis, morbidity, cost, and many patients that are told that they need a re-excision will opt for mastectomy because they don't want to go through even more procedures if the next re-excision shows more tumor. So getting back to the meta-analysis that was published in 2010, there were some very interesting data in there that showed that there was, in fact, in this database, no significant difference in local recurrence rates associated with margin widths of one, two, and greater than five millimeters when adjusted for the use of a radiation boost or endocrine therapy. So this raised the whole question of, what are we doing by trying to get larger and larger margins? So back in July of 2012, Monica Morrow, who's the chief of breast surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Jay Harris and I wrote a piece for the sounding board section of the New England Journal in which we titled it Surgical Margins and Lumpectomy for Breast Cancer, Bigger is Not Better. And this was a very provocative piece in which we tried to advocate for a shift in thinking about the relationship between margin width and the risk of local recurrence. And our goal was to save patients from an unnecessary additional surgery. Now, what prompted this at that time? Well, the fact of the matter is local recurrence rates have been decreasing since the early days of breast conserving therapy. For example, the 10-year local recurrence rates among patients in the Joint Center database in Boston declined from 20% in the early years to 5% in more recently treated patients. Furthermore, we have a better understanding of the impact of tumor biology on the risk of local recurrence. And we now know that more biologically aggressive types are associated with higher local recurrence rates, regardless of margin widths, even after mastectomy. Finally, we recognize now that minimizing subclinical tumor burden in the breast by surgery is less important in current times when most patients get effective adjuvant systemic therapy, either hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, or HER2-targeted therapy, in addition to surgery and radiation. And many studies have now shown that effective systemic therapy substantially reduces the local recurrence rate, and now almost all breast cancer patients get some form of systemic therapy. So one of the things that we called for in this sounding board piece was an evidence-based consensus to try to resolve the issue of how wide a margin is sufficient. And as if by magic, 
we got funding from Susan G. Komen to do just this. So, well, actually, it really wasn't magic. It was hard work on the part of Monica Morrow. So in July of 2013, the Society for Surgical Oncology and the American Society for, Sur for Radiation Oncology convened a consensus on margins in invasive breast cancer. And the co-chairs were Monica Morrow, representing SSO, Mina Moran, a radiation college, uh, oncologist representing Astro, and I was the representative for CAP. Now, the more I thought about this and the more I looked at this list, the reason I finally concluded that they chose me is that Monica Morrow and Mina Moran wanted a pathologist whose first and last name started with the same initial. So the panel convened a, uh, a um, meta-analysis which was used as the primary evidence base. And this meta-analysis consisted of 33 studies with over 28,000 patients, among whom there were over 1,500 local recurrences. And the consensus guidelines that we developed apply only to patients with invasive breast cancer treated with breast conserving surgery and whole breast radiation therapy. And not surprisingly, the meta-analysis first found that positive margins are associated with at least, at least a two-fold increase in the risk of local recurrence, and further that the increased rate of local recurrence associated with positive margins is not nullified by the use of a radiation boost, systemic therapy, or favorable biology. So having positive margins is bad, and there's not much you can do to overcome it. But the crux and the most important part of the meta-analysis is this table, which looks at the impact of various margin widths on local recurrence when adjusted for treatment covariates, including endocrine therapy and a radiation boost. And as you can see from this table, the odds ratios for local recurrence are not significantly different whether the margins are two millimeters or five millimeters when compared to one millimeter. So basically what this says is that when patients get systemic therapy and a boost of radiation or a boost of radiation, increasing margin widths by millimeter intervals doesn't make any difference in the local recurrence rate. So the consensus guidelines were published in February 2014 simultaneously in the Journal of Surgical Oncology, the Red Journal of Radiation Oncology, and the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and it turns out that this article was the Annals of Surgical Oncology most cited article in 2014 and 2015. So this article and this consensus has had a huge impact on the clinical community. And the bottom line of this consensus is the following. A positive margin of lumpectomy specimens defined as ink on invasive cancer or DCIS is associated with at least a two-fold increase in local recurrence. Negative margins, defined as no ink on tumor, optimize local control. Wider margin myth widths than no ink on tumor do not significantly further improve local control. And the real bottom line and the most important take home message from this consensus document is that the routine practice of obtaining margins more widely clear than no ink on tumor is not indicated. And when you really think about it, the use of no ink on tumor as the standard for an adequate margin in invasive cancer in the era of multimodality therapy, which includes systemic therapy in most patients, is in fact associated with low rates of local control. And if this is adopted universally as the standard, has the potential to decrease reexcision rates, improve cosmetic outcomes, and decrease healthcare costs. Now, before these guidelines were published, they were reviewed and endorsed by the Society of Surgical Oncology, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, ASTRO, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. More recently, since their publication, they've been strongly endorsed by the St. Gallen Consensus Conference, and most recently, the NCCN guidelines, version one of 2016, says the NCCN panel accepts the definition of a negative margin as no ink on tumor from that consensus document as the standard for a negative margin. So what does all of this mean for pathology reporting of margins? Well, these consensus guidelines, in my view, should influence how clinicians interpret our reports rather than how pathologists report margins. And I think we as pathologists should continue to report margins per the CAP guidelines. A positive margin is when you have ink on invasive cancer or DCIS, 
and for margins that are negative, report the distance to the negative margin for both the invasive cancer and DCIS component. Now, so far I've been talking about breast cancer as if it were one disease, perhaps with variations in outcome. But if we've learned anything in the past decade or so, we've learned that breast cancer is in fact multiple molecularly and genetically distinct diseases. And as a breast pathologist, I have a contractual obligation to show this dendrogram, which I believe has been shown at every breast cancer lecture since 2001. But basically, this emphasizes the fact from the study of Sorley et al. that when you apply gene expression profiling to a series of breast cancers, you get various molecular subtypes, emphasizing the fact that this is not one disease. And I think most of us now think of breast cancer in this way that there were ER positive tumors, and among those there were the luminal subtypes, luminal A and B, and ER negative tumors, the most common subtypes of those are the HER2 enriched type and the basal-like type. And furthermore, we know from the TCGA that there is heterogeneity even within these subtypes. For example, some luminal A show PIK3CA mutation and others don't. Some basal-like cancers show P53 mutations and others don't. So we now know that breast cancer has enormous heterogeneity at the molecular level. And this subtyping by molecular classification has prognostic significance. And this is representative of early studies looking at this. And all of the studies that have been subsequently done subsequently pretty much show the same thing, that the luminal A's have the best prognosis and that the HER2 and basal-like cancers have the worst prognosis. So what does this mean in, term, in terms of predictors of local recurrence, something near and dear to my heart? Well, this is really a field in its infancy. We do know, as I said before, that more biologically aggressive types are associated with local recurrence rates, higher local recurrence rates, regardless of the margin width. And this is demonstrated in this study from Jay Harris's group at Dana-Farber and Br Brigham and Women's, looking at the incidence of local recurrence by molecular subtype as defined by immunohistochemical surrogates. And not surprisingly, what they found is that the luminal A cancers have the lowest risk of local recurrence and that the HER2 and triple negative types have the highest risk of local recurrence, consistent with what's seen in distant failure as well. Furthermore, we've learned that the Oncotype DX recurrence score, which is a molecular prognostic multi-gene signature, which was developed to predict risk of distant recurrence, also predicts local regional recurrence. So it's really a biological readout of the biological behavior of the tumor. And we've learned again that wider margins don't overcome bad biology. So what is the future of lumpectomy margin evaluations? Evaluation? Are we going to continue to ink lumpectomy specimens or is there something better? Well, there is a lot of research being done in the field. There are uh, methods that are commercially available now, including margin probe, which uses uh, a radio frequency spectroscopy and electromagnetic response to assess margins intraoperatively. There are also efforts to look at margins through spectral imaging, optical imaging, high, frequently, high frequency ultrasound, and molecular analysis of the breast tissue surrounding breast cancer. So this is all on the horizon, and I think some of this will come to fruition, but none of this is really ready for prime time. So what was the role of the breast pathologist of yesteryear? Well, Back when I started through my residency, it was to provide a diagnosis. And here is a breast pathology report from the 1970s from my institution. This is the entire report, and the diagnosis was infiltrating ductal carcinoma breast biopsy. But the role of the breast pathologist of today and tomorrow has changed. And I think for breast pathologists, you can remove that and insert your favorite subspecialty. So sure, we still need to provide a diagnosis, but our role is far more than that. We have to assess and report prognostic factors for distant failure and local recurrence, predictive markers for responses for various therapies, molecular alterations, therapeutic targets, and we as pathologists have to retain the role as curators of the data. We need to be clinical consultants and we need to be an essential member of the disease management team in our various specialties. So instead of the breast pathology report of the 1970s, today our breast pathology reports look like this, and this is one of the short ones. 
because it doesn't have the addenda for ERP or, and HER2 IHC, HER2 fish, and molecular prognostic assays. So in 1979, breast pathology was practiced based on morphology, but in 2016, it's morphology supplemented by biomarkers and molecular assays. I actually think I look much better now, actually. So anyway, before I end, there are a couple of things I really need to say. I have not worked alone over the years. I have had wonderful colleagues. I've had two chairmen, first Hal Dvorak, then Jeff Saffitz, who've been unbelievably supportive and have helped me so much in my career. And in particular, doctors Jim Connolly and Laura Collins have been my close colleagues, and I couldn't work in my department without them. But, you know, when you do a lot of work and you publish a lot of papers, I think sometimes people think it's going to have a lasting impact. But I am not delusional. I honestly think that probably in 20 years, nobody will remember a single thing I've done. So to me, the most important thing about being in academic pathology is your trainees. And what I am most proud of in my career is having had to date from 1995 31 breast pathology fellows who I am very, very proud of and who have gone on to do great things on their own. And when I see them here presenting papers, chairing sessions, it really warms my heart. And to me, this is what academic pathology is all about. So I thank you for your attention and I thank you once again for the honor of giving this lecture. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. That was a great lecture, Dr. Schnitt, as I fully expected, as I told him. Um, I wanted to let you all know there is a uh, reception over at the Sheraton Ballroom, um, Generation U party. You can see it up here, and I hope to see you there. Thank you very much for attending.